All right, I'm going to go back to demos now. Passage of some moving parts. This was it's not pretty, but this is the spreadsheet I showed them at the time when we were looking at it. Looking at different heating, oops, heating technologies. So what are my choices for heating technologies for a residence? And so typically when you build housing around here, unfortunately, they're still using electric resistance heat, especially in the multi-family house. So that's, that's good for what, one thing. It's like every watt of energy you put into an electric resistance heater is heat into the space. So when you think about it in terms of efficiency, it's 100% efficient. So I'm going to use this term COP. That's 100% efficient at producing energy that comes to it into heat for the space. So OK, that's, maybe that's good. If you used a boiler, the very best boiler technologies you've got out there that are making hot water for you, condensing boiler, one that actually recovers some of the lost uh, um, moisture or, or vapor, vapor that goes up the flue if you don't capture it, it's going to maybe get to 95% efficient. Probably if we have a low temperature heating system here in that range most of the time. It's a little less than this because you still need to heat up the chimney. There's a couple of heat pump technologies out there that you can consider. So ground source heat pumps, where you're actually coupled to the ground with a heat exchanger and pulling and extracting heat from a very stable temperature body of, in the 50s, if you design it right, it doesn't change too much, has it, about three and a half times as efficient with the amount of electricity you put into your heat pump and producing useful heat. So it's 350% efficient, this is 100% efficient. An air-cooled heat pump, <clears throat> though they're getting even better still than when I did the study, because you're trying to extract heat from a colder outside air sometimes of the year, Ground is in the 50s, outside air is colder. It's harder to extract heat from that. So it's more efficient than electric resistance heat, but it takes you know, maybe about two, two and a half, maybe three if you're really lucky, uh, it's your COP. So, so that's from an energy standpoint, you can start to think about it. Now, for this project, we wanted to be carbon neutral as well. So we needed to look, to be carbon neutral, you have to understand what does it take to produce that energy back at the source, back to the utility source. And so PSC provides us conversion factors for the electricity that's delivered to your home in terms of how much energy and source energy or carbon is produced associated with that. And so this is the factors you get there. So for a million BTUs of heating I provide for a home, at the Z home, this is the pounds of carbon we would be emitting uh, somewhere wherever the energy is produced. It could be right on the site of using condensing boiler. So here, all of a sudden, you see how inefficient it is to use electricity from the standpoint of carbon and source energy. It takes 322 pounds of carbon back at the power plants, even though I know we have hydro here. Don't ask me how they did this. Um, <laughs> they do that with coal power plant. Yeah. Well, the way, the way I think about that is, um, you know, we have a lot of hydro here. But if you're building new homes, all the hydro is accounted for already. There's no new hydro. So a better way to think about it is, is where is the incremental power coming from? And that's not coming from hydro. It's coming from coal or gas or something. So, so, so it's a real user on the carbon side. These other guys, that, Condensing boilers using natural gas at the site, and because of the inefficiency, it's still got a higher number than if you look at a ground source heat pump, because it's three and a half times as efficient, you only get 92 pounds. And then the less efficient air pool for the electricity it requires, you're about 134 pounds. These are all using electricity, it's just these are using a lot more efficiently. So now if you think of it in terms of the kilowatt hours of energy per million BTUs of heating useful you get, this is the numbers you get. So you can see that it only takes 83 kilowatt hours of energy at a ground source heat pump to produce a million BTUs of useful heat for the place. So now, from the standpoint of Z-Hill, what this means is, how many square foot of PV do I need on the roof to offset that much energy per million BTUs? So the ground source heat pump, I only need about eight and a half feet of PV on the roof to offset a million BTUs of heating in the space on an annual basis. But the condensing boiler, I need 30 feet. We know that, that that's expensive. We know that the PV is expensive. So from a cost perspective, from a real estate perspective, you know, all of a sudden, this technology, which people don't typically put in homes because it costs a lot, starts to come out cheaper. And so if you look at it in that way, we looked at a condensing boiler, an air source heat pump, and a ground source heat pump. And this was a, and we said, all right, so what's the base system cost? And you can see the ground source heat pump system would be a lot more money. But when you consider if we want to be net zero, we need additional PV on the roof to offset it. And we say this is the baseline. We don't need more additional PV relative to this. All of a sudden, you need a whole lot more money with the condensing boiler. The total cost of the job with these other technologies becomes more. So all of a sudden, it's like, dang, you know, we can justify 
the best technology it would require to be net zero because of that PV offset, if you will, that we get from it. Okay, domestic hot water, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Some of the obvious things you do, I mean, domestic hot water requires energy to produce that hot water. So if you use less hot water, those little shower heads, residential projects, the code used to be that you could only have so much flow through a shower head, but the rich guys put multiple shower heads in their shower stalls. So they were, <laughs> and so now the code doesn't let you do it. So we're saying only a single shower head. The code doesn't let you do that now? No, it doesn't let you do it anymore. Uh, so, local shower heads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, low flow shower heads um, are, are a matter of taste, whether you like a low flow shower head. So, for Z-Home, we had a little drawer where we put multiple shower heads. They could choose which one they liked. So, they gave a little flexibility. Um, you have dishwashers, you have clothes washers. You know, best of show, Energy Star appliances, was it really used less water? Uh, you could consider something called drain water heat. Recovery. I think someone I was talking to is about recovering heat from water. Uh, you know, the water down the drain. The problem is, you only have water going down the drain a few hours. You know, at most in the daytime, and it's maybe not a very efficient thing to do. But you could save something that way. Uh, if you stored that drain water in a big tank and then ran a heat pump, you could probably get more heat out of it that way. But we didn't do these on Zeno. You could also use what's called a heat pump hot water heater. Has anyone ever heard of that? That's what this is right here. It looks like a water. It looks like the tank you have for your water in your home. And up here is a heat. Is that the ones they call it instant hot? Where you turn nope, that's a different one. Okay. This thing actually stores hot water in this tank, has a heat pump on the top of here. And the idea is like if you're in California where you've got a cooling dominated climate, put this in your house, it extracts heat from the air, cools the air in the house, and makes you hot water. Or if you live in a mild climate, you put this thing in your garage, extracts heat from your garage, makes you hot water. Here, because we have a heating dominated climate, I don't think you want to put this in your house because you end up having to, you know, if you're extracting heat from the air in the house, you have to make up for it by heating the air. So you wouldn't do that here. But it's a pretty cool concept to certain pilot zones. And then we looked at solar thermal as an option as well. And we didn't end up using it on Z Home because we, we ended up trying to choose something that was simpler rather than more complex. So this was this is schematically a little bit about what we got. So we have a ground source heat pump that I'm not showing here, a couple to the ground. Here's the heat and we're distributing water. The way we actually did it, these are hot water tanks in the homes. And we actually have one heat pump for hot water tanks, so we changed that a little bit. Originally, we thought we'd have one heat pump for the whole complex. So think of this making hot water, putting it in this tank. And so what we're making with the heat pump is actually our domestic hot water that we use for our showers and our sinks. So we're making that water at 130 degrees. And then we have a heat exchanger going through that that's picking up heat from that tank to heat the radiant floors that we've got in the project. And the reason we're able to get away with that is because low temperature heating. We don't need hot water for heating our house. So if we put a heat exchanger for this, we can get 90, 90, 100 degree water, plenty, warm enough for radiant heat in the house. And so we actually, just as an aside, if you're gonna do this kind of strategy, you have to select a heat pump that's rated for domestic hot water use. There's a difference. Okay, domestic hot water, staying on that topic, Here's again one of my fancy spreadsheets, which I used at the time, which I just carried forward. Um, we had data on typical domestic hot water use in different residential units. Uh, so we actually had so we had information on gallons per day typical. We don't know actually how much the people in those homes are going to use, but we have typical data we can work from, so we can come up with the gallons per year. So we can do a pretty simple spreadsheet calculation to get kind of an allowance for domestic hot water heating energy using the heat pump. And so that's kind of so again, this is the counting system we're talking about, so we came up with a solution that way. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, go back. Uh, it doesn't say there, all right, I'll just tell you. So for Z Home, a couple things that we did is we did not connect hot water to the clothes washer, and the developer was okay with that. So no hot water for clothes washing was part of the, part of the plan if you wanted zero energy. The other thing built into the assumptions that we're telling the Octane tenant or the people that are going to buy those homes is if you want to save energy, when your dishwasher is done cleaning, open it up and let it air dry. Don't do this heated drying thing. I mean, that's convenience. There's really no reason you need to do it otherwise. All right, so we're getting to the operations and the occupants. So occupants in that same study make a huge difference in terms of what they do. Uh, how they set their thermostat. If they set their thermostat wrong, you can use a whole lot more energy than you think. 
uh, put on a sweater. And then there's this other thing called plug mode, everything that plugs in. And if you aren't managing how the energy is of your, you know, these, these guys, or the things you plug into the wall, you use a lot more energy. The tricky bit is to understand how occupants occupy a space. In an office building, there's some typical curves, you know, on the course of a 24-hour day and a week day that you use in the ASHRAE model for when lights are on, when people are in the spaces, sort of a percentage of full unload occupancy that you follow. So your, your models are probably using this. Is that right in any particular building? It only may or may not be. It's very coincidental whether it's right or not. So if you're going to do a Xeno, an actual building that hits net zero energy, you really got to peel the onion a little bit on this. And so you can take, oh, I'm getting that cut off the so for, for projects that we've done, you could do like a spreadsheet and say, all right, so if it's an office building, how many workstations do I got? How much power do they all use? How many hours per day are they going to be on? And you can start to create a spreadsheet to come up with an allowance for energy for plug loads. And so when you're doing your calculations on net zero energy, you say, all right, so I know plug loads are this. And you can put that into your, into your eQuest model and get a gain from that as well as track the energy. So you can do a spreadsheet, actually. One way to do it. Problem is, Reality, people are in buildings different hours per day than you think. And so, you know, these are bands. This is, I think it's also from the New Building Institute study, where you can see that, you know, you might make an assumption about a library having this many hours a week occupancy, but it could vary. A hotel could have a wide variance, depending on how busy that hotel is. And so, what's the reality? And plug load as well. We make assumptions about the, how much plugged in the wall and how much energy is going to use. It can vary a lot as well. So what are the right assumptions for this? If you're going to do a project which actually pencils out for net zero energy, you need a little more information. So a uh, project I'm working on right now, that horseshoe-shaped project I showed you before down on uh, that the Army Corps of Engineers is doing. Uh, it's a new building, but they're an existing old, ugly building with big, giant floor plates. And we said, hey, this is new building is going to have to have a very high performance goal. Why don't we measure how you're using energy in your existing building and we can give you some ideas on things you can do differently. So this is 25,000 square foot floor plate, and it's a mixture of, of cubes, and private offices, some conference centers. There's some other equipment there, plotters and copiers, uh, and some other stuff as well. And we said, there's one panel that basically serves all that. So if we put a meter on that, and we also went around and put meter on selected workstations to see how individual occupants behave, we can get an idea of what's going on, and we can maybe get a real good budget for energy use that we can talk about when we talk about performance. So this is private office, and this is days and days back in the, uh, October 2010, and this is sort of their max draw of energy. And so you can see this guy works a four day work week, and then he goes home. And you can see the profile goes up and down during the day. So what that suggests to me is he turns his computer on, but he's got, it cycles down to a hibernation mode or a low energy mode when he's away from his desk. Then he goes off at night. So this guy's ideal. This guy's doing what I would say is a good thing. And if you can give him a low energy workstation, a laptop or something, he's good. Here's another guy. Um, this guy came in, he only worked a three day work week or went somewhere. He wasn't, he didn't have to be turning everything off at night. So he's using energy at nighttime and then he's using energy during the day. And then he was gone for a long stretch and left everything on. Then he remembered that we were monitoring his workstation. He started turning things off. <laughs> uh, but you know, you can suddenly say, all right, Occupants can make a huge difference on the energy draw that they have in their space. So this is an aggregate profile for the entire 25,000 square feet. These are the ash rate profiles for occupancy, this magenta one, and lighting. And this is the actual energy use profile they have. And so one thing you can see is, gee, they're really not using as much as the peak as we thought, so that's, that's maybe good. Um, but you can see there's a big lost opportunity in, in the morning and the evening hours where they could, if they shut things off properly, actually get the energy use down. And so this was this this is something you can go with and you can go talk to the people and clients and we do this and say, look, you have opportunities here, you know, better equipment, better power management practices, better just turn this stuff off. All right, now my question. You see this little lump going up and down here of energy at night? Anyone want to guess what that is? Uh, good guess, we weren't monitoring the system, we were just monitoring the electrical flood loads in the space. We didn't have the HVAC, but that's a good guess. So with that in mind, I don't want to guess. Piece of equipment in the space. Piece of equipment in the space. In the space, yeah. that was doing that. Uh, it's not a space here. He got it. What? There was a big refrigerator in the middle of the space. Oh. So that's cycling on and off of the refrigerator. So that's the thing that was on all the time. Well, it was, it was doing this much. 
Okay, all right. This sure, is, sure. This is okay. everything else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just right. when it that's cycles on, it's doing that. Yeah. yeah, so that's pretty. Yeah. So fridge. That's the fridge. Yeah. All right, so here's the residential side of that equation. Here's what we plug into the wall at home. Or a lot of us plug into the wall at home. Most of us plug all of it in. And all this stuff uses energy. And so if you're going to do a Z-home, how do you deal with this? So you got to find some data. Uh, we didn't have the option of going and metering existing homes, but some people have done some of that. So here's some stuff we found. Um, Build America, which is an uh, portal for Oregon, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory website, has some data on homes. And so they have, like, this is a microwave oven. It shows typical microwave energy use and, the, and sort of the distribution curve. So you can see most people use this much energy on their microwave, so they're eating their coffee in the morning. This guy is cooking all his meals that way, but that's not what you've got. So for an assumption for the Xeon project, you can say, okay, so that's probably what a microwave uses. So that's what we'll use for our assumption for the microwave. So we had starting points. We had this Build America database, which actually gave all kinds of appliances and how they typically use energy. It dates from the 90s, so we had to sort of refine it for you know, these kinds of monitors, which is the old kind of monitors. Um, we had to we adjusted it for improved occupant behavior. We're assuming the people in the Xeon behave better than they do in a regular home. And we adjusted for best of show energy star equipment. And then we sort of, we, we did this, this, this stuff was based on a certain type of number of occupants in the home and we adjusted for occupants. Another thing, have you ever heard of phantom loads or vampire loads? Okay, so you know that if you turn stuff off, it sometimes still uses energy. So at Z-Home, we, we provided some switches that allow you to actually leave a space and turn everything off just by turning that switch off. So it makes it a little easier on you. Documenting assumptions, lots of spreadsheets, all the different stuff we've got. All the sort of the energy budget, if you will, that we're going to balance with PV. Uh, there was a lighting allowance model. So lighting in a residence, you know, it's not like doing sophisticated daylight models. It's a question of how long do people have lights on in different spaces. So there was a source of that, a study done in the Northwest. Hours per day, people typically have lights on in different spaces. And so that gave us a basis for saying, all right, so how many lights will people have on in different rooms of their home? So we use this data, and we knew the information on the floor plans and how many fixtures they had. We knew they were going to use all contact fluorescence before LED was maybe as ready as it is now. And we just came up with a spreadsheet. So we came up with an allowance for a, a one bedroom, two bedroom, and a three bedroom based on hours per day can go run, different rooms that are applicable to the project, the amount of watts they've got, and we came up with a number. And so this is the idea. You take all this stuff, you've got the eQuest model that's doing the fancy stuff, but the plug load stuff, you got to come up with you know, basically a spreadsheet of assumptions. You got to communicate those spreadsheets to whoever's going into that project so they know that, you know, yeah, you can be at e home, but we don't expect you're going to be having parties every night cooking for 20 friends. That's probably not going to balance out to net zero on a year. So you kind of, so it's, it's guidelines. So, it's, so a net zero project may or may not hit its target, and there's always going to be some assumptions baked into it about how things are going to operate. So in this case, we, we're able to come up with budgets. Now we're down in the 5,000, 6,000 kilowatt hour range, which is enough. Uh, we can put enough PV on the roof to offset that. And then we've also got some site energy built into it as well with the solar panels. All right, so renewable resources, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, because I want to get to the last part. Um, but the things you've got to ask yourself is, you know, what do you have in abundance at your site? You know, what are the types of PV that you could, or types of renewables you can use, and are there any planning considerations associated with that? So that's a geothermal, which we don't have that kind of geothermal around here. Uh, building integrated wind versus PV. Uh, one of the points I made in, in the break was that this stuff is still cheaper than this stuff. And, and the wind here is not super, super great, so you have to really decide whether you need that uh, to make your project go. You can get charts that tell you how much solar insulation or wind you have in different regions. And you can also find some local information. Uh, you need to figure out how much roof space you've got. You've got to figure out when the sun's going to be on your roof. Is there times of year when you've got constructions or not? Figure out that stuff. So you need to understand all those things to come up with a calculation of how much you're going to actually from these. Uh, you can look at the solar thermal. Uh, they have a little higher efficiency because they're just trying to produce heat from the sun rather than convert it to electricity. Um, they used to have a better cost payback than PV, but the incentives right now, it's actually probably a better cost efficiency in this state to use PV, particularly if you buy in-state power for PV. It's manufactured in the state. Uh, and then wind, there's lots of things you need to consider, uh, including the heights, because you want to get up there where the wind is steady. Uh, whether you have line of sight availability to the wind, you know, the class for your location, the consistency of it. And this is the big killer, actually, for building integrated wind. Does anyone know what AHJ stands for? 
authority having jurisdiction. They're the code guys, the local Bellevue guys, or whoever they are to tell you whether you can do stuff or not. That's where the obstacles are going to come from as much as any place right now. Yes. But you can find out about wind. There's data on it. Uh, you can also look at alternate fuel sources if you consider this in the equation. Uh, biomass, I mean, if you have a waste stream of biomass that you can take advantage of, that's, re that's renewable source, so you can make an argument for carbon neutrality over time, you might consider biomass. All right, well, and then this is just some images of Z-Home where you're looking at the sun and trying to figure out times of day. So quick thing on Z-Home, quick thing on TV here. I know I'm running home. Um, if you can get good sun, exposure for your PVs from 9 in the morning to 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And you can get that exposure from, say, April 1st to October 30th. Then you got 90% of what you can capture. And the reason is that the sun's not out a lot in the winter and the sun's less intense. Think about when you can get a sunburn and when you can't, when you think about that. And that's, so, that's, so you really want to target the sweet spots. Okay, post-occupancy. So this is the dashboard in your car, it shows you all the stuff you can assimilate. You know, lots of information, we all understand it, we look at it. And this is what we have in our buildings to tell us how the buildings perform, right? So uh, I used to work for money while I get away with that. Uh, so what we're doing now, and what we did on Z Home, is we're putting in advanced metering and sub metering to actually track the energy in the existing buildings. So I showed you before, that flood load study, we put in temporary meters. Now we're putting these things in and we're tracking and we're having they call dashboards to provide real-time information on how buildings are using energy. All right, I, did, I put this in because I think it was interesting because you were talking about this building and existing building. A little case study. Uh, the Finney Neighborhood of Seattle, uh, the Finney Neighborhood Association has a couple of old school buildings. Uh, they're located right by Red Mill Burgers. Anyone know where that is? Okay. Um, there's a couple, I think you might find that. So they've got a couple of buildings and they were very, had their hearts in the right places. They wanted to look like, what can we do to turn these old school buildings into living buildings, and therefore net zero energy buildings? But what would that look like over time? So we got hired with an architect to take a look at this. And here's a couple of images. They have a, what they call the brick building, which is a long building, about 20 some thousand square feet. And a really cool looking old blue building. They call it the blue building. Uh, gorgeous, it's all, and they haven't changed them. Inside, they're just, they're just like they were. They look like old schools, and they've got those drinking fountains down here for the little kids, and it's, it's really cute. Um, and they actually use energy pretty efficiently in the blue building because they've got little unit heaters in each of the rooms. They turn them off and they're not using them and they're very conscientious. Uh, but it's, it's got huge picture windows and it's got basically no insulation. So it's going to use a lot of energy, right? Still